In 2005, news broke that the classic lineup of Pink Floyd was going to reunite for the Live 8 concert, Roger Waters included, and fans everywhere were like, Pigs really have flown, man. Seriously, after Roger Waters left the band, sued the band, insulted the band for their two subsequent records, not to mention David Gilmour throwing a few insults back, we all just assumed a Pink Floyd reunion with Roger was impossible. And even then, the three-man Pink Floyd had been mostly inactive since the Division Bell tour a decade earlier. As I said in the last video, David Gilmour seemed pretty dismissive about working with Pink Floyd and showed on his in-concert release that he enjoyed a more mellow, stripped-back performance. Roger had also proven himself as a touring artist, Richard Wright garnered some respect for his album Broken China, and Nick Mason even published a book about the history of Pink Floyd, which has been very helpful in research for the series. There's even reports that Sid Barrett, now going by his birth name, Roger, I'm just gonna keep calling him Sid or this'll get confusing, was starting to acknowledge his past by the early 2000s, like viewing John Edgington's 2001 documentary with his family, and even signing copies of Mick Rock's book. Unfortunately, he was in ill health, so the chances of him appearing on stage were non-existent. Also, Pink Floyd's manager, Steve O'Rourke, passed away in 2003 from a stroke. He was 63. The three-piece Floyd did come together to honor him privately at his funeral. By 2005, I was a die-hard Pink Floyd fan, and I can tell you, nobody expected the classic 70s lineup to reunite again. But Bob Geldof, star of the Wall film, was hopeful. Bob had organized the original Live Aid back in 1985, and for its 20-year anniversary, he was planning Live 8, coinciding with the G8 Summit, to make poverty history. Which didn't exactly happen, but credit for trying. The event was, of course, packed with stars, but all eyes were on the much-anticipated reunion of David Gilmour, Richard Wright, Nick Mason, and yes, Roger Waters. I just have to say, one, no one in Pink Floyd world feels that you guys ever said goodbye properly, and that's true. Two, it's 20 minutes. So Bob called David Gilmour about the idea, and he said no. Although I guess Dave did let Tim Renwick and Guy Pratt know about it, with both of them thinking, well, that's never gonna happen. So Bob rang up Nick, who contacted Roger about the idea. And I think Dave was a bit surprised when the phone rang. <laughs> And it was me. And sure enough, Dave agreed to do it. Rick was also on board and they were off. I just thought I would probably regret it if I didn't um, do this one-off date for this very, very good cause. But this is Pink Floyd we're talking about, so it's not like everyone was hugging and smiling when rehearsals started. Apparently Roger had a whole idea of what they should play, including another Brick in the Wall Part 2, but Dave nixed this considering this was a benefit to improve education in Africa. Singing We Don't Need No Education seemed like the wrong message to send. Basically, David said, look, they've asked Pink Floyd to play, and we're Pink Floyd, so we're going to do these songs, and if you would like to play them with us, that'd be great. As much as they try to present their rehearsal featurette as them being the Four Musketeers, you can see that Roger and David are still butting heads over arrangements. Nick's laugh says it all. You really gotta give Nick credit for playing Peacemaker. Regardless, rehearsals went as smoothly as they could have gone, and on July 2nd, 2005, for the first time in 24 years, David Gilmour, Nick Mason, Richard Wright, and Roger Waters stood on the London stage and performed four songs for the audience. John Karen, Tim Renwick, and Dick Perry reprised their roles, with Carol Kenyon singing backup vocals. Guy Pratt was supposed to play bass, but he was already committed to play with Roxy Music. So this might have been a blessing in disguise because you really wanted Roger there performing his musical role he had through their peak years. They even started the night with Speak To Me playing. Imagine being in that crowd and hearing the beginning of Dark Side of the Moon knowing what's coming. And BAM! They start the opening chords to breathe. Roger's looking like he's having the time of his life. David looks really uncomfortable. Nick looks like he's waiting for a food fight to break out in the school cafeteria. And Rick... Well, I don't know what Rick's thinking because the camera so rarely cuts to him. I remember the first time I saw this video just shouting at the computer screen going, WHERE'S RICK?! You know, the 
screen didn't answer back, but... That being said, the performance is everything you want it to be. They really start to loosen up on Money, another good version. Great to hear Rogers starting off the iconic bass line, Dick plays his sax solo, and Dave's guitar is solid as always. On Wish You Were Here, Roger, now holding an acoustic, talks about how emotional it is to be up there with his bandmates. Standing up here with these three guys after all these years. I like the way Nick kind of looks over at him, like, yeah, you say that after you sued us. But I do really appreciate that he gives his respects for Sid, and I love that Rick nods his head in agreement. Roger even sings the second verse, which is a little odd, but hey, Roger's there, might as well feature him. And you know, as critical as I've been over Roger's voice throughout these videos, I do like hearing the different interpretations he and David convey together. And featured again he is on the climax of the set, Comfortably Numb, which in thinking about it is really the only time they played the song properly as a band. There's no wall separating them, Roger's actually playing bass on the song, and they have a really energetic jam at the end. I mean, in terms of Dave's playing, Pulse is still my favorite, but to hear him and Roger singing together is the real miracle. Honestly, seeing this overhead shot of the four man on stage jamming together, it really brings closure to how brilliant the four of them are together. It is very intense. Not just Dave's blistering solo, but Nick's signature fills, Roger's piercing bass, and Rick's swirling organ. It really is the one and only Pink Floyd together again. And in one last clash, their reunion show is over. It's kind of funny the way Roger needs to coax Dave to come over for a curtain call, and man, did they exploit the hell out of this image. And for good reason. I mean, look at it. It's the four men who brought us Metal, Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, and The Wall together in 2005. So now that they had all played together, we started thinking, man, what's next for Pink Floyd? A full tour? A new album? Well... Rick and Nick were on board no matter what, though Nick has always seemed very skeptical. Uh, we were talking about, um, you know, leading a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Well, these horses can't even be led to the water. Roger kind of went back and forth. In the BBC documentary, he seems interested in the idea. But I'd like to do more of it. I thought it was really cool. But he's also quoted as saying he's not going to roll over for a whole effing tour. Immediately following the reunion, Roger premiered an opera he had written called Saira about the French Revolution. I'd always loved the sound of big orchestras, so to have the opportunity to um, use one was something that I grasped with both hands. I don't feel I'm the most qualified to speak on the quality of an opera, but props to Roger for writing such an ambitious piece and the performers who brought it to life. David was the one who most consistently said no. And the reason is because he had been working on his first solo album in 20 years, On an Island, released in 2006 and produced by Phil Manzanera of Roxy Music, who you might recall co-wrote the song One Slip off of Momentary Lapse of Reason. And I gotta say, this is a strong contender for best solo album from a member of Floyd, and sounds closest in spirit to a real Pink Floyd album. It's my best album to date, I think, without any doubt, and uh, it is the most personal. I love that it starts in a Speak To Me style, quoting soundscapes of other songs alongside an orchestra, followed by that trademark free time guitar song over orchestral pads. Then we segue into the soft title track, which features David Crosby and Graham Nash on vocals, Guy Pratt on bass, and Richard Wright on organ. Even Bob Close, an early lead guitarist for Pink Floyd, appears on this track, though he's credited as Rado Close. It's a nice mellow tune with memorable harmonies, and as usual, Dave's guitar work is top-notch. One of my favorite David Gilmour songs is The Blue, a hauntingly beautiful ballad that features both David and Rick singing harmonies, the last time we would hear their voices together on a studio recording. So but the moment that sends chills down my spine is Dave's whammy guitar solo. It's interesting that the song quotes Marooned from The Division Bell, but this solo might be even better. It's like every single note has been meticulously chosen for an amazing climax. What's amazing is how many instruments Dave plays on this album, including saxophone on Red Sky at Night. Really, Dave? Being a master guitar player isn't enough? You have to be a sax player, too? 
Polly Sampson is pretty much the lone lyricist here, with Dave contributing lyrics to a couple numbers and composing all the music. Lyrically, there's nothing that stands out too much, but two that really caught my ear are This Heaven, where David sings about his earthly heaven, notably his family, being enough for him. Life is much more than by. I think it kind of sums up where David's mindset was on the promise of millions of dollars to reunite Pink Floyd. Pocket Full of Stones I interpret as a commentary on the changing climate, and it's a very beautiful song, even if it's also kind of mellow. And that's my biggest criticism of the album, it's pretty low energy. With the possible exception of Take a Breath, there's really no What Do You Want From Me or Take It Back to bring the energy up. Still, as mellow albums go, it is very compelling. Is it the best Pink Floyd solo album? Well. Somewhere between the biting commentary of Roger Waters' Amused to Death and the musicality of uh, David Gilmour's On an Island is the perfect Pink Floyd solo record. Maybe at some point I'll compare all of their solo records. David toured with Rick joining his band, including Guy Pratt, John Karen, Dick Perry, along with Phil Manzanera on guitar, and drummer Steve DeStanislau. Though when he performed at the Royal Albert Hall, Nick Mason sat in on drums for the encores, so it practically was a Pink Floyd show at that point. These shows were released on DVD entitled Remember That Night, and that's a damn good performance. Crosby and Nash reprised their roles from On an Island, David Bowie got up to sing Arnold Lane and Roger's part in Comfortably Numb, but it's really Rick who stood out for me. When Bowie wasn't there, Rick sang Arnold Lane and Comfortably Numb and sounds great singing both. The absolute standout is a full performance of Echoes. This time Dave and Rick sing in unison, while John Karen sings the harmony. It's just great to hear them sing together again, and Rick's organ licks are in fine form. I remember watching this with my dad and him saying, Wow, Rick's really cutting loose on this one. Yeah, for Rick, that is. I love this shot of David Crosby watching from the wings. Even he knows how special it is. As much as I'd like to see Roger there and Nick playing drums the whole time, this is just as good for me as any Floyd reunion tour. And artistically speaking, I love that David decided to just play the new album in its entirety. I had the chance to see them perform in LA back then, and for reasons I can't remember, I didn't end up going, and I am just kicking myself now for not having gone and gotten a chance to see David Gilmour and Rick Wright perform together. There's a good behind-the-scenes documentary where Dave reveals that him and Roger are coincidentally rehearsing at the same rehearsal space. But we've, I mean, we've been out on tour already, so it's just nothing to rust off. They look so uncomfortable standing next to each other. And sure enough, Roger also toured in 2006 and spared no expense when it came to the theatrics. Again, John Karen joined him on keyboards. Man, performing with both David and Roger? That must be exhausting. Roger didn't do much solo material, though he did feature a recent single called Leave in Beirut, criticizing the Iraq War, and particularly George W. Bush. Oh, George! Definitely a highlight from the show. This concert never got an official release, but from what I can see on YouTube, there are some solid performances, including a full performance of Dark Side of the Moon. Though admittedly, hearing this album performed without Dave and Rick is as jarring as hearing Pink Floyd perform Brain Damage without Roger. Live Aid had showed us how magical these songs could be when all four members were together, and after both of them completing world tours, I doubt either wanted to go out again as Floyd. But if there was one moment that could bring them together, it was to honor their friend. On July 7th, 2006, Roger Sid Barrett, the crazy diamond who had started us all on this journey, passed away from pancreatic cancer at the age of 60. It was naturally a sad moment for all members of Pink Floyd, but I think Roger made a lot of sense when he spoke in the BBC documentary. When Sid died last year, I realized that, you know, by and large, I'd, I'd already done all my grieving. Indeed, that fateful day he visited the Wish You Were Here sessions in 1975 seemed to be the moment they realized the man they'd come to know as Sid Barrett was gone. And despite his many health issues, at least he was able to live a quiet life at home painting and gardening in his later years. On May 10th, 2007, a tribute concert was held in honor of Sid called Madcap's Last Laugh. All four members of Pink Floyd would perform at this event, though not at the same time. 
According to Mark Blake's book, it was kind of up in the air whether Pink Floyd was actually going to perform, a lot of decisions happening at the last minute. But what ultimately happened was, after a number of renditions of Sid Barrett songs, Roger appeared on stage at the end of the first set with John Karen to perform not one of Sid's tunes, but a solo number called Flickering Flame, which had been released years earlier. Okay. He did give a nice verbal tribute to Sid, but clearly everyone was hoping he'd join his fellow bandmates on stage for an early Pink Floyd song. And appear they did. David Gilmour, Richard Wright, Nick Mason, John Karen, and Andy Bell from Oasis. Okay. Regardless of who was on bass, they did a great rendition of their first single, Arnold Lane, Rick handling lead vocals as he did on Dave's tour. And you know, watching this again reminded me that Rick was just the right guy to sing for Sid while rocking that Farfisa organ. He always seemed to keep the spirit of Sid's experimental and whimsical nature a part of Pink Floyd's arsenal. And with the psychedelic light show, it was just the perfect way to honor Sid's memory. And they would also join everyone on stage for a final performance of Bike. Well, almost everyone. According to Joe Boyd, who organized the event, Roger could apparently only be there till a certain time because he was going to meet his girlfriend at the airport. I'm dubious about that claim. I mean, really, Roger had said he was open to more reunions and everyone was there and they were paying tribute to Sid Barrett. I mean, did David not want to perform with him, maybe? Honestly, I really haven't found anything else to go on. And unfortunately, they would never get this chance again. Any opportunity of the classic lineup reuniting truly ended on September 15th, 2008, when Richard Wright passed away from lung cancer at the age of 65. I still remember when news about this broke out, and I was shocked. And as far as I'm concerned, this was the end of Pink Floyd. And David rightfully said he would not tour as Pink Floyd again without Rick. I do realize that Rick was not involved with the final cut, and I have seen plenty of comments that say, well, if Pink Floyd could go out and tour without Roger, why can't they go out and tour without Rick? And to be honest, it's a legitimate claim, although I think it's a little bit different when someone willingly leaves the band as opposed to when someone passes away. But here's the thing. I would say Roger was integral to the writing of Pink Floyd. Rick's keyboards and voice were integral to the sound and live performance of Pink Floyd. As much as I love David Gilmour's guitar playing, Rick's keyboards are the first thing that come to mind when I think of the band. The iconic Farfisa heard on so many of their early records, the piano ping of Echoes, the hauntingly beautiful piano chords of Great Gig in the Sky and Us and Them, the Moog solos on Any Color You Like or Shine On You Crazy Diamond, the Rhodes on Sheep. Even the chord sequence in Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, not to mention his contributions to the Division Bell. And if that weren't enough, I also think of his harmony vocals with Sid or David on songs like Astronomy Domine, Burning Bridges, Us and Them, and especially Echoes. This is the sound of Pink Floyd I want to hear performed. Rick's presence is really lost when either Dave or Roger have performed Time or Us and Them without him, especially on... Uh, we'll get to it when we get to it. For me personally, regardless of the politics of the band, I just don't think Pink Floyd should do a reunion tour without Rick. At least we had one short reunion with the four men. Look, before 2005, we didn't think we'd ever see them reunite again, so this was almost a gift to see them go out one last time in a blaze of glory. Sure, a tour would have been amazing, even a full run of shows like the ones Cream did around the same time. But I don't think it was ever going to happen with Pink Floyd. Roger and David just had their own careers, and probably preferred being able to call their own shots. Rick certainly didn't seem to mind either. I'm just getting so much pleasure out of this tour, I really am. And it's kind of it revitalized my whole love of going on stage. Live 8 was just lightning in a bottle, a moment in time where all the stars aligned, the four men came together for a noble cause, and performed four classic songs together with Rick Wright one last time. It's also why it pains me so much that you barely see Rick in the video. After his passing, all members of Pink Floyd paid Boston. tribute to him. Because he would have been playing with you tonight as well. He was supposed it? to be on the show, and he, he in fact, uh, 
let me know only very recently that he wasn't going to be able to get here. David appeared on Jules Holland with the remnants of his band, including Guy Pratt, who was Rick's son-in-law, to honor his late bandmate with a performance of Remember a Day, Rick's song from Saucerful of Secrets. It's a really nice performance and reminds you of Rick's unconventional writing from the early days. So with the four-man Pink Floyd reunion idea shattered, you think the chances of David Gilmour and Roger Waters getting together again are non-existent, but you'd be wrong. On July 10th, 2010, both men appeared on stage for a charity to raise money for Palestinian children. This wasn't my idea, it was his idea. I remember seeing news of this and just going, really, now you guys reunite on stage? The band also included Guy Pratt and Roger's son, Harry Waters, who had played keyboards on his previous tour. They performed Wish You Were Here, Comfortably Numb, and they even did another brick in the wall this time. So in return for Roger's participation, David agreed to perform Comfortably Numb at Roger's 2011 performance of The Wall at the O2. This tour ended up becoming one of the biggest selling to date and was documented in the film entitled Roger Waters, The Wall. Certainly an amazing spectacle, though not quite the performance that Pink Floyd did in the early 80s. But on May 12th, 2011, David Gilmour appeared on top of the wall for Comfortably Numb, just as he had on that original 1980 tour. This blew everyone's mind. Look at Roger, even he can't believe it. Mind you, it's not one of Dave's better renditions of the song, even he admits that. But to see him on stage with Roger hugging it out, I think that got even bigger applause. And if that weren't enough, Nick Mason appeared on stage. The three surviving members of Pink Floyd performed the final song of the wall, Outside the Wall. After decades of animosity, even with Rick gone, it really was heartwarming to see them together. Enjoy it while it lasts. Of course, at this time, nobody expected Pink Floyd to release another album, especially with Rick gone. But sure enough, they would release one final album. And we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> <laughs>